How big of a disaster are the New York Jets? And there was a lot of sadness. There was a lot of sadness for the year that uh, that could have been. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor to be with you guys. Now, if your quarterback is both the cause of and the solution to all of your problems, you might be in a, a bad situation, a complicated situation. Aaron, even after 20 years, you can learn something on this one. It's a good one, dog. Like all Jets fans, I'm sick of seeing this clip used to signify a team or person's success ending before it ever started. Like many, I was rooting for the Jets to have success. They've been down long enough. The New York Jets, though, were 7-10 without Aaron Rodgers in 2022. And then they were 7-10 with, without Aaron Rodgers in 2023. Then, The Athletic dropped a bombshell of an article outlining the dysfunction within the Jets organization. One that seems to have way too many people willing to talk to the media in secrecy. Can the Jets be saved by simply watching Aaron Rodgers return to good health by gracing them with, with his presence every week on the football field for 2024? Or are they doomed to repeat failure for the foreseeable future due to issues running much deeper than Rodgers? So today I'll try and answer just how bad the New York Jets really are and why Aaron Rodgers might be closer to getting compared to Russell Wilson instead of Super Bowl winning QBs Tom Brady, Matthew Stafford, and Peyton Manning who all had success changing teams late in their career. That's good sport. Today's show is sponsored by Good Chop and my code, That's Good 120. That code will get you $120 off your first four boxes. What's Good Chop? It's a box of meat that magically shows up to your door. Then you take that meat, you cook it, and you eat it, and it's delicious. Now, I've been rocking with Good Chop exclusively for a while now, and I can't recommend their beef enough. 100% grass fed. Ribeyes. Well marbled cuts, their steaks are my favorite, and my wife Jess loves their fillets. All of the meat is sourced in the USA, and it never has antibiotics or added hormones. But here's what I've been doing through the entire football season. I love seafood, and fish and shrimp are some of the easiest and fastest things to cook in a pinch, and you can get those in good chop. A little warm water thaws them out super fast, but the nights where I'm working late, I'll drop a third of a bag of shrimp into a small pot with garlic, salt, and butter, maybe a diced onion and pepper, and just eat a, a plate of shrimp with my salad. Most meals we do here in my house as a family, but when I'm grinding, I probably ate that meal like once a week this season because it was so easy and delicious. Go to goodchop.com slash YouTube and use my code that's good 120 for $120 off your first four boxes. Athletic beat writer Zach Rosenblatt wrote an article last week uncovering a shocking truth. The New York Jets are a mess. We already kind of knew that, right? What we didn't quite know is to what extent they're a mess. And they've got, they've got not just a messy house, but underneath that mess is black mold and asbestos in the walls. Now, to be clear, I thought the athletic piece was a bit over the top. I think every team has some level of dysfunction that you have to manage in-house. That's the way of the world. And we all know the New York media is on another level with negative team coverage. The article doesn't really touch on how well liked Aaron Rodgers is by his teammates until the very end. He was literally voted most inspirational player by his teammates. To be voted that, I was sitting up in my seat, didn't expect anything, and so I was actually got a little emotional as I was walking down and tried to kind of get down there as quickly as possible so I wasn't you know, crying in front of the guys or anything, but. Rodgers may be a weird dude. You may or may not like him, but if you're a Jets fan, the thing giving you hope for this upcoming season, besides perfect health for Rodgers, is remembering how much hope the players showed with his arrival, the chemistry they were building before the season started. It takes a real bond for two adult men to create a handshake that shows just how they'd fillet a very small penis if given the chance. And Rodgers and Sauce Gardner perfected that little tiny dick-sucking handshake, didn't they? Now Rodgers' reputation took hits during the season because he had too much time to talk on Pat McAfee's show. But before the injury, 
He was carrying a level of joy and optimism that I felt like we hadn't seen from Rogers for a while. Yeah. What's up, little bitch, huh? You look fat as shit. You said 260. The Jets were in the mix for the playoffs for a while, even with pseudo GM Rogers building a that the team not able to sustain without him, which might be part of his weird plan, right? Bring in guys he knows can only succeed with him, <laughs> which makes him look more valuable. But even with all the crap I'm about to get into, they really only had one tragic flaw besides offensive line. No plan for an Aaron Rodgers injury. Now, there was one big surprise to me in this article, and it could be a huge problem. Amidst the swirling chaos, the guy that we all thought was pretty even and had a good head on his shoulders was the head coach, Robert Sala. But even Sala was not immune to the horrible energy in the Jets facility last year. He'd read negative press clippings, apparently, and get upset that the Jets would get trashed in the media more than the Giants, calling it unfair. To me, that reeks of jealousy. The Jets are the official team of the Sopranos, and all things Italian-American. And I know they were pissed that they missed out on the Tommy DeVito experience. On one hand, you have a guy who lives with his mom. And on the other hand, you have a guy who just sleeps with moms. And on another, another hand, you have a guy who doesn't talk to his mom. He also, Sala, bemoaned his bad luck after the Rogers injury and was wondering if he was doomed to the same fate as Vic Fangio in that he was a great defensive coach who could never find a quarterback. The quarterback he did have in 2023 was, of course, Zach Wilson. And while Sala was always complimentary of Wilson in front of the media behind closed doors, apparently, he blamed the offensive failings on him and told people around him that getting to eight wins with Wilson at QB would be a miracle. Here's what annoys me annoys the fuck out of me if the above is true. I endured the Fangio years here in Denver. Both Fangio and Robert Sala made their quarterback beds. Sala was the head coach when the team drafted Zach Wilson in 2021. Vic Fangio was the head coach when the Broncos drafted Drew Locke in 2019. Both failed in either contributing to or evaluating the quarterback and or developing the quarterback. You can be a defensive head coach, but you better understand the most important position in all sports. You can't bitch about your quarterback and be the guy who brought him in. Both guys also, also failed with Joe Flacco, by the way. Just another weird coincidence. And look, if you're not a Zach Wilson believer, then guess what? You had all off season to upgrade the backup position. That should have been your top priority. The health of a middle-aged quarterback who was banged up the year before, far from a guarantee as the Jets found out. And their alternative was the guy who had been in their building for the last two seasons. The very first draft pick of the Sala regime. The fact that Wilson was bad in 2023 should have surprised literally nobody, especially Robert Sala. But if you head into the season with Rodgers and optimism with Wilson as your backup to develop under him, I can forgive that. The Jets' real failure to salvage the season after Rodgers got hurt is the ultimate sin. Joe Flacco was available. He was on your team the year before, and I'm not saying he would have played at the same level all season like he did with the Browns, but in the year of the backup, the Jets did nothing. <laughs> now, one of the canary in the coal mine moments of uh, the Jet season came in December when The Athletic reported that Wilson, Zach Wilson, was reluctant to return to the role of starting QB when he was benched uh, for Tim Boyle, who was eventually released after two weeks of starting, with one of those games including the, the Boyle Hail Mary that turned into a pick six against the Dolphins. The fact that Wilson's reluctance got leaked to the press infuriated Sala quite a bit, and he was so hell-bent on finding the person within the organization that leaked it that he threatened to take the cell phones of everyone on his coaching staff. Which I don't think he can do. Which also makes me think Sala really hated that article. The Athletic Report reads that the coach held a meeting with his staff two days later where he asked the leaker to reveal himself according to multiple people in attendance. If you come forward now, you won't get in trouble, he told them while threatening to take their cell phones. Has that ever worked, by the way? Clearly, this was handled uh, about as poorly as it gets. This is obviously not what you should do in this situation. Let me tell you what you should do. 
You tell each of your coaches a different piece of information, and whatever gets leaked to the press identifies who the rat was. It's that simple, and I learned that from Lord Varys from Game of Thrones, a master of manipulation. Also bald. Now look, the Athletic spoke to 30 different sources inside and outside the organization. They had more sources than Philip Rivers and Antonio Cromartie have offspring combined. If you're looking for the rat, you'll have to change that to plural rats. Now obviously, Saul is not the only coach that gets flamed in this report. I'm sure you can guess who the other guy is. His name rhymes with Nathaniel Hackett. Ah, fuck, I just said it, didn't I? Hackett, of course, is widely regarded as one of the most incompetent head coaches of all time, fired midway through his first season with the Denver Broncos, but uh, landed on his feet with the Jets a couple months later, most likely at the request of one Aaron Rodgers. Now, apparently, Rodgers would override Nathaniel Hackett's play calls in training camp, and when Hackett was asked by other offensive coaches why they were running the plays they were running, he'd reply, because that's what Aaron wants. That quote on its own doesn't raise too much of a red flag for me, but when you pair it with the idea that Rodgers had the power to veto whatever play came through the radio, you've got a quarterback who has his coach by the balls, and simultaneously a coach who can't seem to even learn what Aaron Rodgers likes with the play call. Don't forget, we launched our new mugs over at benchwarmerbrew.com. We got our F the Refs blend and we got mugs. Do you need a mug? No, nobody needs a fucking mug. Everybody's got like 50 mugs in their cupboard, but you can buy mine. Something has been conveniently forgotten from Aaron Rodgers' back-to-back -back MVP seasons a few years ago regarding Hackett, and it's pretty important. Hackett wasn't calling the plays then. Matt LaFleur was. Pairing his knowledge of scheme with my knowledge of experience. Hackett was the offensive coordinator for the Jacksonville Jaguars in 2017. Technically, when I call this play, I have no clue what's gonna happen. When they did advance to the AFC title game and lost in heartbreaking fashion. And that team was actually pretty damn good. The offense was better than we remember too, scoring 26 points per game, which was good for fifth in the league. That's why I was excited about Hackett coming to Denver, but it's also important to remember that they were second to last in scoring a year later when they followed up that season with a 5-11 and record. What a great play design by Nathaniel Hackett. But technically, when I call this play, I have no clue what's gonna happen. Obviously, Rodgers tore his Achilles before they had a chance to introduce the starting offense in week one. One of their starting wide receivers, Corey Davis, retired a week before the regular season, forcing them to rely on players like rookie Xavier Gibson to get a ton of snaps at the position. The offensive line went through 13 different starters and 13 different combinations up front, which I don't need to tell you is a recipe for disaster. But none of that absolves Hackett from the very serious allegations that he doesn't really know what he's doing as a play caller. Take Brees Hall, for example. 127 rushing yards, week one, in that crazy win. Nothing from Hall again until week five in that gutsy win against the Broncos. The Jets lose those three games in between, but it feels like they find the formula as Hall had 22 carries for 177 yards while beating Denver. Problem is, Hall doesn't see 20 carries again until December 24th in a win against Washington. 13 carries and an L a week later, 37 carries and 178 yards in a week 18 win against the Pats. Struggling young QB, lack of weapons at wideout, terrible pass protection. Run the ball with your best player on your offense. It's the most fundamental shit that Nathaniel Hackett can't seem to do. What? I think is important to note is that Hackett was brought in by the Jets because of his relationship with Aaron Rodgers. I don't think he got there because of his resume. If the relationship with Rodgers is strong, then it's hard to call it a bad move. But if the power dynamics aren't as good as we thought, as the athletic report has suggested, then it could be a massive disaster no matter what moving forward. The Athletic also told us that the Jets are effectively looking to demote Hackett, saying that the team lost confidence in his ability to run the offense by itself. Robert Sala has explored adding to the offensive staff and creating a more collaborative play calling process that would reduce Hackett's role according to the report. 
Sala may have appeased Rodgers by hiring Hackett, but he fucked himself by not hiring an offensive coordinator who could coordinate an offense with Zach Wilson or any other QB. Hackett is like Aaron Rodgers' yes man, or perhaps even his emotional support coach, like some people have with dogs. Sure, you can keep him around, but you wouldn't let a golden retriever wearing a vest drive your car or do your taxes, which... Is the Airbud sequel we deserve, but never got. What concerns me about the Jets is that I'm not sure Rodgers returning to the starting lineup is the cure-all that they're probably counting on it to be. Aside from the fact that their facility is divided, there's a big question that still remains. Reality is uh, our perspective. It's informed by our perspective. Are we sure that Aaron Rodgers is still really, really good? And by really, really good, I mean elite, Tom Brady won that ring in his first season with the Buccaneers because that team was stacked. The Jets have the defense to match Tampa's, but not the top three offensive line like the Bucks. Stafford had the line, plus triple crown winner Cooper Cup. Rodgers made the mistake Russell Wilson made and joined a team he was supposed to fix by making up for some of their deficiencies instead of joining the unit that was simply in need of a quarterback. Units that were being held back because they didn't have a quarterback. There are no guarantees that Rodgers is still elite. Rodgers turned 40 two months ago and outside of Tom Brady, who remains a genetic anomaly, there's not uh, a storied history of quarterbacks keeping up an elite level of play once they hit that age. We watched Tom Brady win Super Bowls and play at an MVP level after he turned 40. So we assume that other great quarterbacks can do it, but I am not convinced until I see it. In 2021, when he won his fourth MVP, Rodgers threw for over 4,100 yards, 37 touchdowns, and just four interceptions. A season later, Rodgers' numbers dipped. He only threw for 3,700 yards, 26 touchdowns, and his picks jumped up to 12, the most he's thrown since 2008, which was his first season taking over as starter. And guess what? That was 2022. He was 38 for most of that season, and now he's 40 coming off an Achilles tear. And I don't care what surgery he got, it's still concerning. So we don't know if he'll be the same Aaron Rodgers that we know, and maybe some of us love, depending on where you stand on several issues. There's also the fact that there is no successor in the building. There's no Jordan Love. There's no Aaron Rodgers to extend the Packers metaphor and confuse you even further. The Jets pick at 10 with no second rounder, which puts them out of range for any of the top three QBs in the draft, barring a trade, which feels unlikely. Do you want to take Bo Nix or Michael Penix to develop behind Rodgers when they're already 25 years old? And take one of those guys and not upgrade another key position to help Rodgers? That feels like a precarious pick for a team that still has pressing needs at tackle and wide receiver, two positions that are actually pretty deep in this draft. I don't think the Jets are set up all that well for the future. I'm not convinced they're set up well for the present. Robert Sala might not be the head coach that they, they need. Rodgers really might be in his last year. Plus, he lost an entire season to see what worked and didn't work with Rodgers. Meaning, the figure it out year that was supposed to be 2023 is now 2024, and the offensive line is in shambles. My prediction, the New York Jets finish at 8-9 in 2024, which might even be worse than finishing 7-10. and Are the Jets a disaster? If Aaron Rodgers is very good, no. They have a nasty defense, one that could be the best Rodgers has ever played with. Sauce Gardner, Quinn and Williams, Bryce Huff, who is a free agent, Jermaine Johnson, DJ Reed, they're loaded. An amazing young running back in Brees Lightning. There's more reason to believe, though, that Rodgers won't stay healthy or will regress than the latter. With one giant exception, Rodgers plays his best when he has spite on his side, and he's got more to be spiteful for than ever before. He might be poised to win comeback player of the year based on that alone, and if he plays as well he might be inheriting a team that survived the worst case scenario and is ready to shock us all the line between success and failure for this team is so thin it's impossible to predict thanks for watching that's good sports please subscribe here on youtube tomorrow uh come back i will have a very specific super bowl power rankings episode where i'm gonna power rank well you know what just come back and find out